Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today I'm going to be talking about schizophrenia. This is me continuing to do a series on mental health disorders, mental health illnesses. Also, I'm not sure if I'm going to continue doing podcasts anymore. So this was also looking back going, what would I regret? And doing TV shows and movies is fun, it's a blast. But I would regret not doing specific mental illness podcasts to target like the five to nine major things. So that's what I'm going to be doing today. As always, I'll read the article mostly word for word. There'll be a link in the description so you can follow it. I'm going to use the same site that I used the last time. It was the National Institute of Mental Health. Again, I will put the link in the description. If I forget, let me know. But this is me going through my, you know, my playlist of like 300 videos, deciding if I'm going to keep going or not, and going, you know what? I really wanted to do one targeted specific mental disorder or illness, and each one, and I know there's like up to 12 now, I think, the way they keep making more, but you know, five. So that'll be the focus of these. So I'll start with schizophrenia. What is schizophrenia? Schizophrenia is a serious mental illness that affects how a person thinks, feels, and behaves. People with schizophrenia may seem like they have lost touch with reality, which can be distressing for them and for their family and friends. The symptoms of schizophrenia make it difficult to participate in usual everyday activities, but effective treatments are available. Many people who receive treatments can engage in school or work, achieve independence, and enjoy personal relationships. What are the signs and symptoms of schizophrenia? It's important to recognize the symptoms of schizophrenia and seek help as early as possible. People with schizophrenia are usually diagnosed between the ages of 16 and 30, after the first episode of psychosis. Starting treatment as soon as possible following the first episode of psychosis is an important step toward recovery. However, research shows that gradual changes in thinking, mood, and social functioning often appear before the first episode of psychosis. Schizophrenia is rare in younger children. Schizophrenia symptoms can differ from person to person, but they generally fall into three main categories, psychotic, negative, and cognitive. Psychotic symptoms include changes in the way a person thinks, acts, and experiences the world. People with psychotic symptoms may lose a shared sense of reality with others and experience the world in a distorted way. For some people, these symptoms come and go. For others, the symptoms become stable over time. Psychotic symptoms include hallucinations. When a person sees, hears, smells, tastes, or feels things that are not actually there. Hearing voices is common for people with schizophrenia. People who hear voices may hear them for a long time before family or friends notice a problem. But by the way, this is close to me in a sense where my mother's mental illness, this was part of the, you know, soup of genetics and crap. I think we'll get to that eventually. I know a friend who I love very much. Next is delusions. When a person has strong beliefs that are not true and may seem irrational to others. For example, individuals experiencing delusions may believe that people on the radio and television are sending special messages that require a certain response, or they may believe that they are in danger or that others are trying to hurt them. Yep, yeah, that is a big one. Thought disorder. When a person has ways of thinking that are unusual or illogical, People with thought disorder may have trouble organizing their thoughts and speech. Sometimes a person will stop talking in the middle of a thought, jump from topic to topic, or make up words that have no meaning. Movement disorder. When a person exhibits abnormal body movements, people with movement disorder may repeat certain motions over and over. Negative symptoms. Include loss of motivation, loss of interest, or enjoyment in daily activities. Withdrawal from social life, difficulty showing emotions, and difficulty functioning normally. 
Negative symptoms include having trouble planning and sticking with activities such as grocery shopping, having trouble anticipating and feeling pleasure in everyday life, taking in a dull voice and showing limited facial expressions, avoiding social interaction or interacting in socially awkward ways, having very low energy and spending a lot of time in passive activities. In extreme cases, a person might stop moving or talking for a while, which is a rare condition called catatonia. It's funny that these symptoms, you know, certain people, even on uh, TV shows, live TV shows or movies and stuff, you can notice it. There was one I'm thinking of in particular, where talking in a dull voice and showing limited facial expressions is constantly happening but you know you really don't you know it's just a difficult thing and please always be thoughtful with people understand that these things aren't totally their fault and we'll get to that later which they'll show some you know what factors and stuff these symptoms are times mistaken mistake of symptoms of depression or other mental illnesses so what i just described yes it can be that's why a lot of these things are confusing too there's so many overlapping issues Cognitive symptoms include problems in attention, concentration, and memory. These symptoms can make it hard to follow a conversation, learn new things, or remember appointments. A person's level of cognitive functioning is one of the best predictors of their day-to-day -day functioning. Healthcare providers evaluate cognitive functioning using specific tests. Cognitive symptoms include having trouble processing information to make decisions having trouble using information immediately after learning it, having trouble focusing or paying attention. Yep. I'm very familiar with these things. The, Center, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, has recognized that having certain mental disorders, including depression and schizophrenia, can make people more likely to get severely ill from COVID. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, oh, by the way, again, there are blue links, highlighted words that lead to other things. One thing I like about a lot of the sites, you can do deeper dives into certain aspects that I bring up and hit the links and learn more. Next is risk of violence. Most people with schizophrenia are not violent. Overall, people with schizophrenia are more likely than those without the illness to be harmed by others. For people with schizophrenia, the risk of self-harm and violence to others is greatest when the illness is untreated. It is important to help people who are showing symptoms to get treatment as quickly as possible. Schizophrenia versus Disassociative Identity Disorder Although some of the signs may seem similar on the surface, schizophrenia is not Disassociative Identity Disorder, which, which used to be called Multiple Personality Disorder or Split Personality. People with dissociative identity disorder have two or more distinct identities that are present and that alternatively take control of them. Something I've noticed also. It's very serious and people decide to go off their meds or they think they can handle things on their own. I'm there, you know, give it a shot, work at it. But you have to realize when certain things are going wrong and that's the problem. I'll continue. What are the risk factors for schizophrenia? Several factors may contribute to a personal, person's risk of developing schizophrenia. Genetics. Schizophrenia sometimes runs in families. However, just because one family member has schizophrenia, it does not mean that other members of the family also will have it. Studies suggest that many different genes may increase a person's chance of developing schizophrenia, but that no single gene causes the disorder by itself. Is a major thing you find out these days. It's not as simple as one thing. Next is environment. Research suggests that a combination of genetic factors and aspects of a person's environment and life experiences may play a role in the development of schizophrenia. These environmental factors that may include living in poverty, stressful or dangerous surroundings, and exposure to viruses or nutritional problems before birth. Brain structure and function. Research shows that people with schizophrenia may be more likely to have difference in the size of certain brain areas and in connections between brain areas. Some of these brain differences may develop before birth. 
Researchers are working to better understand how brain structure and function may relate to schizophrenia. How is schizophrenia treated? Current treatment for schizophrenia focuses on helping people manage their symptoms, improve day-to-day functioning, and achieve personal life goals, such as completing education, pursuing a career, and having fulfilling relationships. Antipsychotic medications. Antipsychotic medications can help make psychotic symptoms less intense and less frequent. These medications are usually taken every day in pill or liquid forms. Some antipsychotic medications are given as injections once or twice a month. If a person's symptoms do not improve with usual antipsychotic medications, they may be prescribed clozapine. Clozapine. People who take clozapine must have regular blood tests to check for potentially dangerous side effects that can occur in 1-2% to of patients. That's got to be scary. I'll continue. People respond to antipsychotic medications in different ways. It is important to report any side effects to a healthcare provider. Many people taking antipsychotic medications experience side effects such as weight gain, dry mouth, restlessness, and drowsiness when they start taking these medications. Some of these side effects may go away over time, while others may not. And that's incredible. You get restlessness and drowsiness. It's so insane how the brain works and all these factors that go into these trillions of connections and it's just it's just fascinating shared decision making between healthcare providers and patients is the recommended strategy for determining the best types of medication or medication combination as and the right dose to find the latest information about antipsychotic medications talk to a healthcare provider and visit the and the link, U.S. Food and Drug Administration, blah, blah, Psychosocial treatments. Psychosocial treatments help people find solutions to everyday challenges and manage symptoms while attending school, working, and forming relationships. These treatments are often used together with antipsychotic medication. People who, particular, who participate in regular psycho, psychosocial treatment are less likely to have symptoms reoccur or to be hospitalized. Examples of this kind of treatment include type of psychotherapy, such as cognitive behavior therapy, behavioral skill training, supported employment, and cognitive remediation interventions. Now, as I grew up with my mom and noticing these signs, I try as a friend to develop a, a thing where, to me, a good friend knows how to be who you need them to be at any time. And I've tried to do these things. Um, and I've tried to come up with my own techniques in helping people and without knowing just to be there. And I've said this before, it's one thing to have a friend you love and you can talk to. And what about a friend you know that you can talk to and love that knows about some of these things? So you can keep the balance going good by just talking to them. You learn about the words they use, how they use them. And it's one of the things I learned when going on uh, helping people with uh, suicide hotline stuff. When you, you, know, you learn about fa- uh, fallacies and how to spot things and listen to the certain words. You can help people. You don't have to become a doctor or anything, but understanding these things is important to me. You can help people who are trying to get through these things. Again, in the end, it might just be a house built on cards that just falls down and whatever, but you do your best. Education and support. Programs can help friends and families manage their distress, boost their own coping skills, and strengthen their ability to provide support. The National Alliance on Mental Illness website has more information about support groups and education. And this is another thing to be serious about. You love these people. You want to help them. But your life is becoming crazy. There's. You're watching them. Just spiral out of control, etc. Having good support and learning and being educated is hugely important. Coordinated specialty care. 
coordinated specialty care CSC programs are recovery-focused programs for people with first-episode psychosis, an early stage of schizophrenia. Healthcare providers and special specialists work together as a team to provide CSC, which includes psychotherapy, medication, case management, employment and education support, and family education and support. The treatment team works collaboratively with individuals to make treatment decisions involving family members as much as possible. Compared with typical care CSC, it is more effective at reducing symptoms, improving quality of life, and increasing involvement in work or school. But what happens when you have a person who, you know, abandons their family and their friends and all their pets and everything when they're left alone? And they're exhibiting certain factors. You just do your best. You just try to be there. And don't give up on them. Assertive Community Treatment. Assertive Community Treatment, ACT, is designed especially for people with schizophrenia who are likely to experience multiple hospitalizations or homelessness. ACT is usually delivered by a team of healthcare providers who, can, who work together to provide care to patients in the community. Treatment for Drug and Alcohol Misuse It is common for people with schizophrenia to have problems with drugs and alcohol. A treatment program that includes treatment for both schizophrenia and substance use is important for recovery because be substance can interfere with treatment for schizophrenia. How can I help? How can I find help for schizophrenia? If you're not sure where to get help, your healthcare provider is a good place to start. Your healthcare provider can refer you to a qualified mental health professional, such as a psychiatrist or psychologist. Who has experienced treating schizophrenia. And then there's a link. Find tips to help prepare and get the most out of your visit and information about getting help. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration has an online treatment locator to help you find mental health services in your area. SAMHSA also has an early serious mental illness treatment locator for finding mental health treatment facilities and programs. All this is highlighted in blue, all the links. It can be difficult to know how to help someone who has experienced psychosis. Here are some things you can do. Help them get treatment and encourage them to stay in treatment. Remember that their beliefs or hallucinations may seem very real to them. Be respectful, supportive, and kind without tolerating dangerous or inappropriate behavior. Good fucking luck. Look for support groups and family education programs, such as those offered by the National Alliance on Mental Illness. All right, this is bonkers right here, because you can... My mother almost called the cops on us, because we were trying to get her to take medicine. <laughs> I mean, you, these are the people you love, you know, just relationships, everything. You can do your best. Be respectful, supportive, and kind. Without tolerating, how do you tolerate not dangerous behavior? What? It's insane. So, again, I don't know. This is bonkers. Uh, there's a thing here if you know or someone knows having trouble with thoughts or suicide, call the, you know, course, that is something you want to always promote. Suicide hotlines, people out there waiting to hear from you, want to help you, support you, you know, give you some focus, realize that. This is the only shot we have, that type of thing. Now, how can I find a clinical trial for schizophrenia? Clinical trials are research studies that look at new ways to prevent, detect, or treat diseases and conditions. The goal of clinical trials is to determine if a new test or treatment works and is safe. Although individuals may benefit from being part of a clinical trial, participants should be aware that the primary purpose of a clinical trial is to gain new scientific knowledge so that others may be better helped in the future. Researchers at NIMH and around the country conduct many studies with patients and healthy volunteers. We have new and better treatment options today because of what clinical trials uncovered years ago. Talk to your healthcare provider about clinical trials, their benefits and risks, and whether one is right for you. To learn more or find a study, visit, and then his links, there's a bunch here. There's um, NIMH's clinical trials, clinicaltrials.gov, 
doing the studies, get your, there's, you can learn some more stuff and find out if these things are good for you or someone you love. Where can I learn more about schizophrenia? Free brochures and shareable resources. Schizophrenia. This brochure on schizophrenia basic opens and signs of information, treatment, finding help also available in Spanish. Oh, so there's links here on understanding psychosis. Then there's digital shareable shareables on schizophrenia. This is great. This is for ease of access. You know, we go through life and we find out, you know, and for me, it was a young age, just realizing something was going on with my mother and well, what was really happening and the confusion, the worry, and learning what I have and being my age is noticing it in friends and family that you love and trying to help them in certain ways. It's, it's an unusual circumstance for me that at, by the time 12 or 13, I noticed something by 16 my mom was like 78, 80 pounds, near death from what I can remember, and in the kitchen, and it was just a nightmare. It propelled me to, you know, quit my job, um, quit school, go to work, and study everything I can get my hands on. I talked about this. I got everything I could from friends and fa family that would go into school and college and went to the library and read things. I talk about how funny it is that what I found most helpful is the things that magicians use and mentalists use to trick people. <laughs> because when, once you know human behavior and like where thoughts and you know everything else goes with mannerisms and where their eyes are going to go, you know how ma magicians can show you a trick and still fool you. It's just amazing. But it put me in a position of, you know, by the time I'm eighteen, I'm this you know guy who try to help his mom and suffers a trauma that he's got to help himself and rebuild himself. And it takes years to rebuild myself in that sense. I went to a psychologist once and ended that funny story is as I was leaving, he goes, you're never coming back. Are you I'm like, no. And he was like, hey, here's one piece of advice. And that was it. But you know, and then I'm not special, right? We all have family members. We all go through everything. We get on a train to go to work and we, we just try and have families and get by but the years go by and these things kind of add up. And if you don't have the tools and some ways of dealing with it, you know, go get help. Uh, take the advice of people around you. This is important. And I find myself now in a position, again, someone I love. And I can't believe the things that they think about me and are saying about me. And it's just, it's not making sense. And yes, I do know one of the causes and such, but we are just all together in this. It's trying to get through every day. Find these resources, ease of access, and get familiar with it if it is a concern to you. Yes, I mean, you might be going through life and there's nothing wrong. But if you do see signs and you do love somebody, you want to get involved, these are great links that help you get involved. And then there's research and statistics, uh, Accelerating Medicine Partnership Program. Early Psychosis Intervention Network, Journal Article, Psychotic Disorders Research Program. All these are highlighted blue links. And I implore everybody who is interested, right? And this is not, um, you know, this is that everybody's going to take all these mental disorders and, you know, find, find people they love and just go try to help people. But when it comes to your attention, when you start noticing the things and you really care and you love for somebody... You try, and trying means sometimes learning and doing a little research. Then we got, um, oh, we did research and statistics, right? Um, you can go look at the, all the statistics, recovery after initial schizophrenia episode. Really get an idea of how these things work and what people go through. I mean, can you imagine schizophrenia or disassociative disorders? Depression, bipolar disorder, I mean, these things are with us. They're part of our genes and part of the environment that all these factors come into play. Be understanding, try to be caring and loving. Don't give up on them. Do your best, is my recommendation. Communicate when you can, but 
again, you start learning these things, you have to know you some boundaries, right? Even, you know, even psychologists and you know, real people with degrees, not the idiot like me, who, who, who technically, I guess you could say I have 15 years of experience. So, like, I would be able to be called to a fucking uh, witness stand, maybe, I guess. And, like, there's some laws about that. Like, driving, right? You know, I'd be a fucking expert driver or whatever. Anyway. These mental health issues that I'm doing, again, are one of the ways that I would not walk away from podcasting and have regrets. I want to do one on each major thing. Give people informed. Let them know. This is everywhere. It's with our families and friends and loved ones that we care about. When we watch them go from one thing to another. I have my own issues. I've talked about it. One of the first things I did was depression. And that's majorly, you know, what I have to deal with. And it's not a chemical, you know, function of uh, genetics for me. It's a series of, well, first it's being in the right cognitive framework, right? I'm in... Let's just say I started out introverted, you know, quiet, empathic. And I don't mean empathic like super fucking powers. I have to say this a lot when I talk about it. Like being an empath is not like superpowers, right? But being empathic is, anyway. So I feel everything, feel all the feel, all that stuff. In that right mindset of just the type of, you know, personality I had, I was right for it. So... When you look at the different personalities of me and my brother, let's say, you know, I was the one who was going to be more impacted by it. Very attentive, watching everything, moody, thinking about things, worrying, worrying. And what happens? She has mental illness. My life changes. And then, as I said before, I'm not a special, but we go through life. I'm 52. And there are moments of tragedy and sadness and happiness. And it's the roller coaster of life. And I'm here now. Not knowing where my course is going and where I'm heading. A big part of me is de- deciding on whether to just go into the woods and just spend the rest of my days just focusing on this world that I've created in my head and nature and just how I feel so at home. And I'll always thank my friend Joe and everybody else for bringing me to like the rainbow gatherings when I was younger, going camping and stuff. We all have our ways to cope, and learning about these things is important, so that's why I don't want regrets if I end the podcast. I want to do these, well, thank you. I want to do fucking, I thought I had to know, do not disturb. See, that kind of pisses me off. But anyway, more people know, the more you understand, the more we can help, and you can be understanding, and that's the main thing. It's not, you have to fight with people or argue with people. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you have to be more interested in the truth than feelings. And that's how I, that's my motto type thing. And I don't mean truthful just to be an asshole and be hurtful. I mean, you know, to tell somebody the truth and knowing that it can hurt and it could ruin relationships potentially. In any case, this is my podcast on schizophrenia. I will continue to do more, like I said, in this quest to just get out these things that I might regret, that I didn't do a specific um, podcast on a certain mental disorder, because this is how it all started for me. It was my fiancé fighting cancer, you know, us going over. I had gotten my friend with uh, physical weightlifting, and we wrote out these scripts and everything, and everything was going good. My book was being published. Her cancer came back. The world got destroyed. She passed away in the fight. And I nearly died, and I'm just struggling to get back and find myself again. And that's been this process. And part of the agreement I made was that we would do these things, and that she thought I was good at it, and helping, talking to people, being a friend. And then I started doing the podcast, and my interest in Dungeons and Dragons, and gaming, and sci-fi movies. And it just helped me, and it, be, it let me focus, and let me discipline myself in a certain way to build little goals. So this this podcast was also that. And I don't know if I'm going to end that and start on something new. Like playing my guitar again. And, you know, we all try to fit these things into our life. And it doesn't mean we have to cut out the friends totally. You know, we can say hi and let them know that we care still. But, you know, we're dealing with things. And, again, this is what knowledge is, reading up on these things. So 
hope everybody's doing well. I love you all. My best to you and yours. Take care.